It's March Madness over at Tumble Track. 10% off all kinds of mats, and they're having 10% off spring floors. The whole spring floor, 10% off right now. Visit Tumble Track at T U M B L T R A K, tumbletrack.com. Train smart. Remember, this show is PG 13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. The third of the fourth World Cup qualifiers to Paris is complete. Two per event will move on. The rest must wait till 2028, unless they get a continental or tried part eight spot. Who's doing the most in NCAA this week? And we have a mini commission on hair suitness, hair management in gymnastics. Spencer can't wait. It's March 11th, 2024. And welcome to Gymcastic, the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm just getting here with Spencer from the Balance Beam Situation, which has the schedules with score and watch links for all the college meets and everything else you could ever want to watch, including Elite. Let's talk about the Elite news, starting with mm -hmm. what's happening next week because we have a very special interview with hana rishna can you tell mm. the people who hana is they might have heard of the rikna rishna before maybe it could yeah and probably you're pronouncing it rikna um or rikna which oh. is the eponymous stalder Tkachev, one of the earliest uh, Tkachev variations to be invented named after hana rishna also multi medalist competed at the alternate uh, Jessica's favorite competition in the history of gymnastics, the alternate 1984 Olympic friendship games in Olomutz. And, you know, was there in the, in the eighties, the, the golden era of both gymnastics and nonsense. And I'm very interested to hear what she has to say about that. Oh, uh, it's so, it's so, so good as all of our interviews always are getting the most secret stories out of everyone. So here's a little snippet of what you'll hear next week. Usually I was getting hurt from doing something stupid when I was young and did not listen, you know, and <laughs> always, always did something crazy. Always got in trouble. What, like what, what's an example of that? Uh, like we always ran to the gym before somebody was in the gym, so there was nobody there. So we just playing games or tried some skills and equipment. So I had this crazy idea: do backhand spin and beam blindfolded. What? Yeah. <laughs> so. so yeah, this, this was my my ideas like this always. You know? so, so I did that, and then I broke my finger. You can look forward to more stories from Hana next week on the show yes so, so much more to tell other news if you're a club gym member you already know this um gabby is officially officially back at woga again anna lucan confirmed to scott bregman at the olympic channel that gabby had left um but what gabby left the gym that we heard that she was going to the coach there would have been away with other athletes competing internationally. So maybe it wasn't the best time. Um, and then Anna Lucan confirmed to Scott Bregman that um, Gabby returned. Not too much of a surprise, I would say, because um, we've kind of heard that this is, you know, she's kind of looked around at other places before. In terms of Gabby making the Olympic team, because this is a real comeback and we're seeing real stuff. The so most, the most important thing, yeah. Reminder again about what she has to do. Well, what she has to do to make the Olympic team is, you know, perform well at Olympic trials. But we would like, hopefully, in our hopes for Gabby and putting her in the best situation possible heading into the summer, we would love her to be at the April national team camp, get a score that gets her an assignment, get her qualifying scores so that there is no issue with oh you absolutely have to hit at classic in order to advance to championships and then you know she is going to have to you know get to trials perform at u.s nationals in order to advance to trials as everyone will have to but we would love a situation where she's kind of locked in a score as early as possible to take some of the pressure off moving into american classic u.s classic or whatever she elects to compete in um but also just like show us some bars because that training video of the stalder just do stalders. I was just like, we're all happy. 
Mm-hmm. What if he was just like, I'm not going to compete. I'm just going to be in the gym and post videos of me doing stallers all day long, every day. And I would be like, that's the greatest contribution to gymnastics you could possibly give to anyone. I feel like she needs to start like po- posting lots of videos because I think some people still think this isn't real. And it's like definitely real. Like she's not, nobody goes and does like fully gymnastics for a year and a half to not have a real and be able to do gymnastics at this level. So I feel like whenever she posts videos, encourage her to post more and repost them. That is, <laughs> that is your assignment. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the apparatus world cups because Baku is finished. Mm-hmm. This is the third of the four. There's still Ooh, one yes. event to go. Doha, Mm -hmm. April, the same weekend as NCAA Championships and our live show at NCAA Championships. It's a big weekend. Yes. So this is the, you get the points. There's points for the places. You get the points. points. Uh, Fact Tracker can show you the sheet with the points that it's up on the FIG site. They have the rankings up. Um, And it's the best three out of four the person with the most points after you minus the people who are from a country that already qualified, or if they're an individual that already qualified after you minus those people, whoever has the most points out of the three of the four meets, the top two two people go, no one else. So top two in each event. Yeah. So we have three events done one more to go. So we basically know much more of the situation who's in, who's out, who's still in with a shot. So starting with floor, Charlie's Moores dominated again of Austria, won Baku, officially secured herself qualification. She's good. She is in. One floor spot is taken. Second spot still up for grabs. Emma Malibuyo helped herself a ton with her finish in Baku. We talked about in our preview that she really needed a big competition. I think she did everything that she could do in this meet to put herself in a good position. So she's in second right now. She has a 24 point lead on third place, Laura Casabuena, which is a huge lead. And if Malibuyo were to go to Doha, the final event, I would consider her the favorite to get the second Olympic spot on floor. But if she doesn't go, that 24-point lead, if Casabuena were to get first place points among the eligible gymnasts, that's 30 points. Second place is 25 points. Both of those results would pass Malibuyo. So Casabuena will like her chances. Um, Kaisholu of Turkey, also she gets first place points. If she gets 30 points, she could move up into that spot. So she's alive as well. so it, it's come. It's down to those three. There are three people still alive for that second floor spot: Malibuyo, Caspoena, and Kaisholu. It's basically, you know, if Malibuyo doesn't go, she has to, you know. Of course, a gymnast would never say they are rooting for someone else to miss because of sportsmanship and whatnot. But the basically the situation is like you would have to sit there and root for some people to miss, or at least have like not quite their best routine by enough. Um, the maybe twist is that the question of like, will Charlize Moores, the top qual already qualified her Olympic spot, go to Doha now that she doesn't need to get any more points. She's set because she's locked in. She doesn't have to go compete. If she does go compete, that would help Malibuyo because she can take points away from other people. If she doesn't compete, that's just an easier road for Caspuena and Kaisholu. So that's one of the other dynamics we'll be watching in terms of who shows up in Doha, mm-hmm. including whether Emma Malibuyo does and whether UCLA qualifies to nationals as a team, because that will be, I think, a significant factor. It will. Um, I And this is the thing, like when I watch Malibuyo, I'm like, yeah, that's right. She was um, the Olympic alternate for Tokyo, like one of them. Mm-hmm. And yeah, she's really good at gymnastics and she really hasn't and- lost anything. And I love that she's keeping her college routine. Because there's no re if you don't want artistry deductions, which we're going to talk about why Ellie Black has the le- had the least artistry deductions uh, of the top competitors on floor uh, of this year's worlds. Um, yeah, same with Malibuyo. Yeah, and Malibuyo, when you look at the scores, there's a reason she has among the top execution scores, at and that is being rewarded uh, in the elite code as well. She's getting over eight, which is you know in elite world. You're amazing if you're getting an execution score over eight. And she's consistently going over eight and is 
performing well above her D score level because of that. Her D score is fairly low by elite standards, and she's still getting these good results because of her execution. So that in itself is encouraging just for those of us who would love execution to matter the most rather than difficulty. The most! <laughs> ah, okay, let's talk about Vault because Vault, it's over. It's cooked, Vault's done. finished. They don't even have, nobody has to compete. And the last Nobody has to go to Doha. No one can catch them. Um, it's over. The, what I want now to happen is Chuso to go to Doha and win because she's been eliminated. But um, yes, yeah, so An Chung Ok of North Korea, Valentina Georgieva of Bulgaria, they've been leading the whole way. They went one, two again in Baku, switched order, Georgieva won. Um, but yeah, one and two the whole way. They've got those two vault spots. That one's done. Uh, so yeah. That's the simplest one because it's already over. Bars, on the other hand. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We have to talk about Georgieva's fault because she did the best thing ever, which is she's, it's a, it's a lovely Yurchenko fault, which, I mean, I know the points and all of that stuff, Spencer. That's very important. But the best Uh thing. First of all, what, is it also important that it's a souk and not it's a, a souk and not a full? Sorry, um, it is a souk. <laughs> well, it's a full. full. It's not a your. But it's very nice and very laid out. Um, but the most important thing is after she finished and saluted very clearly, then she yeah. did a like drop on one knee to pose and like look at her mu- bent arm bicep muscle and then uh-huh. stood back up. It's like uh, my favorite thing ever. Now, thankfully, she didn't get a deduction for overly celebrating whatever that ridiculous <laughs> d- deduction is. But I love this. Love, 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 love it. Also, coming back from an ACL injury. So, victorious, great Walter. So, stoked for, Bur- for Bulgaria, stoked for her. On the topic of bars, as I started to mention, definitely not over because we've had Georgia Rose Brown leading the way. She missed in qualification in Baku, got zero points. So she still leads, but everyone else is caught up. And now all of the top six on bars are all within six ranking points of each other. That includes Levi Jung Ruivivar. She's six points out of the top spot, but it's also a a tight group, a tight race. Um, So that could still go a number of different directions. I would say Georgia Rose Brown, competing for New Zealand now, and Jennifer Williams of Sweden are still the front runners because they have zeros as one of their scores on the rankings, and you count best three or four. So any points they get in Doha are a gain. Whereas if you already have three scores, like Levi jung Rivivar already has three scores. So she has to improve on a score that she already has or ranking points that she already has in Doha for that to even count. So it's going to be harder for her to move up. Whereas if Brown or Williams hit, then they have much more room for growth to move up. But you got to hit. And that's the thing on bars and beam. We can talk about scenarios all day long, but if you fall on a release in qualification, that's going to be out the window. And with six people so close in the bar standings, it really could go a number of different directions based on who gets points and who doesn't. Yep. Also, I wanted to mention that Namor, I've mentioned this before, she's been competing in these. (laughs) <laughs> and even though she's already she's qualified, good. by the yeah. way, yeah, Namor had the whole thing about, you know, France wouldn't let her compete because of many different reasons. They wouldn't medically clear her to compete. And she has that uh, osteochondritis desiccans, which is, find me a U.S. gymnast that doesn't have that. Um, so she switched and competed to Algeria. Um, and now she qualified on her own at Worlds to the Olympics, but she's been competing, and her scores have consistently been 15 yeah. fours, which yeah. is massive. She's hitting that routine every time. Every time. Like, it looks like exactly like she did in practice and podium training at Worlds when she did the most routines and the mm-hmm. most consistent of anyone that was there. It was insane. And, like, people, you know, a 14-5, you can make a final on bars. She's getting a, a huge bar score. Huge and she's score. like, what if I switched it and got a 15-4? <laughs> she's getting a whole point above that. Yeah. Um, it's also kind of funny because, like, it doesn't seem to matter how she lands her dismount. She's still getting the same score. But, um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I the only thing I worry about, I know it's very early in the year, but I'm just like, okay, now rest and don't burn yourself out doing this. Just like do the least now until it's time <laughs> for the Olympics. This is how much we've been burned by gymnastics in our lives. We're always like, what if you just didn't do any gymnastics ever <laughs> until the Olympics? Please. It's the only way we will feel comfortable by, about anyone. This is where bubble wrap comes in. Okay, so... <laughs> Beam, very exciting news. Yes, Nina has qualified, also has secured Olympic qualification. So once again, qualified because of Beam Apparatus World Cup Series, free to compete the all-around as able to at the Olympics. So it doesn't limit what events you can compete at the Olympics. This is just the route you use to qualify. Second spot, however, for Beam, fully wild, just like bars. Ting of Taiwan had a great event in Baku. Moved into second now, ahead of uh, Erica Pinkston of Belgium, Jennifer Williams, again, of Sweden. She's in the mix on multiple events. Um, so she's in a good position now, maybe the best position of the contenders after Baku. But again, it's beam. So if you fall in qualification in Doha, everything changes. But if Ting hits in qualification, hits in the final in Doha, I like her chances and I like her beam routine. So I would very much enjoy that to happen. <laughs> yes, same. I do want to mention here, I know um, it's it's one of those things, the irony that I am going to mention Palma Horse, although I don't, mm. I also think it's, you know, maybe not the most exciting event. It is when it's the best people in the world doing Palma Horse. Um, and what's crazy is 2021 world champion Stephen Edrashek from the United States competed here and he got a 15 4. You guys, huge, huge, huge score. Uh, yeah, big giant score. So, just in terms of like making the men's team and how hard it is to make it as an individual event specialist and um, how much pressure there is on that spot, mm -hmm. especially because it's palm, palm horse. Um, that's yeah. really awesome for him that, um, he did so well and won. Um, okay, so for Paris, we still have yeah. Doha. Doha. So there's still so five half the spots. spots. So half the spots are set. Nina Derwell, An Chong Ok, Valentina Georgieva, and Charlie's Moores have apparatus spots. Four still to be decided at the Doha World Cup. And then we have Continental Championships for everyone except the Americas because they already did theirs last year. And we have thoughts about that that we've expressed numerous times and how bad it was. Other continents still have one all-arounder. We'll get a spot from those continents in their spring continental championships. And then there is one tripartite spot in each for men and women that goes to an under, a gymnast from an underrepresented country in the Olympics overall. But they have very, very few athletes in the Olympics. They can have a gymnast. Certain countries are eligible. Many are not. Chuso is not eligible, as we established because that was a question about whether she could get the tripartite commission spot, yeah, but Uzbekistan has enough athletes that that's, she's not in that mix, but there are a number of athletes who could end up being that one, which will be announced just at some point. And the tripartite spot is basically like we, you have like at least one elite gymnast, but you don't have enough to have a team, but we want to encourage you guys and you're good enough to. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, the Olympics is supposed to be an international event with a diverse range of countries. So, you know, you have a spot for countries that maybe this athlete wasn't quite at the level to get a spot in the all around at worlds, but they're good. They're close enough. And we want this country to be represented in the parade of all of the beautiful colors of the world and their flags coming in at the opening ceremony. Club gym nerd. You get discounts and first dibs on live show tickets, an extra whole podcast every week, athlete dossiers for major competitions, code guides, options to commission your own segments. It also makes a great gift. Check it out at gymcastic.com at the Join the Club tab. So I don't know if you know, Spencer, but this show is brought to you by Club Gym Nerd. Mm. And um, Spencer, collagen cocktails, speaking of which, Friday. Yes. What, what are we our watching? last, our last Friday collagen cocktails of the season, Jessica. Already, oh, it's the post Plus, maybe not already. Coming. I know we'll do one after conference championships on Saturday the twenty third too. But our last Friday, this Friday, seven p.m. Pacific, we're going to watch Denver against Michigan, 
and then we're going to talk about it and probably some other things. Who can say what it is? We certainly can't. It'll be a secret, a mystery, <laughs> until we find out what fruit we're going to learn how to pick this week. Um, also, big news. Live show happening at NCAA Championships. It will be on mm-hmm. April 19th, the day off, as is the tradition. In, between, the in-betweeny day. The in-between day. We're not going to tell you who our guests are. It is going to be top secret. Or guest, guests, you never know. Might be a whole team. You never know. We have done this before where we've kept the guest or guest a secret. We did it with Alicia Sacramone. And we did it with Kennedy Baker. And seeing, I mean, this is one of my favorite things about keeping it a secret, is seeing the reaction on people's faces when they see the guest or guests when they walk out. So, you guys, um, those tickets will be on sale shortly. And you can get the virtual ticket, three live shows for the price of four, now and if you want to upgrade to be upgrade to be there in person it's just an extra five bucks and you get this huge discount three for the price of four open for club dinner members now and oh yeah i'm finalizing the t-shirts we're putting on a new round of merch so if you guys want some new merch new t-shirt designs because based on college and cocktails this week we have some <laughs> very exciting new ones. We have, um, yeah, we have Spencer's eye roll. We have lesbians for Jessica in Leanne. We trust, um, and converted gym nerd spouse. This is the other, the other shirt idea that we have. So, um, check it out at gymcastic.com. And now it's time for artistry corner. <laughs> Jessica's Artistry Corner, where you sit in a chair and read the uh, elite checklist aloud to the children. Yeah. That should be a PBS show. Oh, my God. I You're would watch like, it. just like, gather around children. Poor body posture. <laughs> Insufficient involvement of the body parts. <laughs> Let's all stand up and show sufficient involvement of the body parts. <laughs> Pam Chinkova, if you want to check this out for yourself, put a link to um, a book that has all the results, including the um, artistry results, which we normally don't get for some reason. They are some kind of secret, and the FIG does not release these, but we have them now. So um, This is for Worlds well, 2023. For Worlds 20, yeah. And there's one for each world, and the Olympics, obviously. Um, so the great thing about this is we can see exactly who was getting the most artistry deduction, who's getting the least artistry deduction, and then you can match it up to watching their routines. So Ellie Black, we've talked about how excellent mm-hmm. her artistry is, um, got the least amount of artistry deductions in this top group. One judge gave her a 0.4 off, four tenths, but two of the judges and everybody else only took a 10th, which is crazy. No one else got a zero deduction from any judges, let alone two judges giving zero deduction for artistry. Um, It is wild. And she only got a 10th, four tenths, and two tenths for another judge. The only other gymnasts who are close to give you an idea is uh, our Flavia from Brazil. Duh, right? You can see it. And Mm -hmm. world champion, Jessica Gattarova. This is for qualifications before she was injured. Um, And, you know, Jessica Gattarova is another example that I always say, like, this is why you don't really have to, um, you shouldn't have to water down your routine. Like when we were talking about Jordan uh, Childs, using um different music and different choreography for her her floor so um we're looking at an old older version her liverpool routine this is a different routine right that she did in liverpool i'm pretty sure yeah um yeah it's a different one but the same thing goes for ellie's routine i just want to talk about why she is not getting i would i would like you to explain to me because like we recognize great artistry routine but why is this one even compared to someone like flavia who were like engaged routine energy performance has all of those things why is ellie specifically has so like clearly fewer artistry deductions than everyone else yep i mean we talk about somebody like flavia like musicality is something that flavia does really Mm -hmm. well she's not using background music like loses musicality from every fiber of her beginning 
Exactly. Like, and everything goes to the music. You have to be in synchronization. It mm -hmm. can't be like background music, all of that. Um, and the music has to be structured. Like you can't just cut together. Like I can't stand what, what the, the fashion is in NCA right now, where it's basically cheerleading music, where it's a thousand cuts, like death by a thousand cuts. It's what's happening with the music in NCA. <laughs> but anywho, um, the reason that she's not getting the deductions is she is using the, like the, I think the, one of the most important things is amplitude in her dance and we don't often think of that but thinking of, of body who's just mm -hmm. like standing there and someone who stands like morgan heard always did when she was standing in line at camp the tallest the straightest the most extended <laughs> fingers just to stand the first in line time anyone like, has described morgan heard as the tallest <laughs> the tallest exactly i'm a world <laughs> champion or i'm gonna be like that's always how she stood like um there's no posture problems. She's doing all kinds of uh, of footwork. She is so expressive, and it's not making faces. It's not being ridiculous. It is. It goes with the music. She's not. It doesn't have to be winking or like. It's not like you know pandering to. I can't stand that stuff. If it goes with your character, if your whole character is like you know pouring it up for your e-score then go for it like that's a character you can play um but uh you know it has to all go together so what i think is that um everything goes together because there has to be fluency in your dance um and it's amplitude in a sea of not really understanding or putting into your routine the artistry checklist the performance checklist and it's not really, she's the example of what we want to see. That's the thing. So, I mean, you think about like, you know, if Simone is getting like half a point or more off yeah, an Some of the judges deck, took six tenths for Simone six in tenths. artistry. It's half a fall some of the gymnasts are getting for mm -hmm. the artistry. It's like, it's not, you know, it shouldn't be that hard to fix. I mean, Simone doesn't matter. She, her tumbling so hard. <laughs> she can take <laughs> so all the artistry. You know, She's about like, yeah. uh, but not if a shot really, impacts you, then you need them. Not if the show. <laughs> but really, it is like Simone should be like everyone else compared to Simone should be losing half a fall in amplitude of tumbling. And things like yes. that compared to Simone. So Simone's like, all right, you give it back in, you know, amplitude of elongation of the movements which is what you were describing before that it's not amplitude of like height off the ground for a leap or a tumbling pass it's amplitude of I, I think it's weird that they also use amplitude for the, to describe yeah. it's this. an internal describe amplitude. elongation elongation is kind of yeah. i think a better a more representative word of what they want yeah. and I, that's the thing i think watching ellie's floor from 2023 is example of that elongation and involvement of the body parts like it's very very intentionally and specifically designed to avoid those deductions yep it's like it's showing you exactly like i am gonna hinge at the hips now and my head's gonna be below my hip level because i'm showing you levels and different things like that it is exactly designed to avoid these deductions which is what you have to do while we would love you know, just general art to be rewarded. It's not just about being artistic. That's not really what artistry deductions are. They're about avoiding the deduction. And Ellie Black, while performing a compelling routine, because I also think it is a compelling yeah. routine where she plays a clear character, there's a clear theme, it's interesting in everything that she's doing, it is also smart and intentional and organized with the deduction checklist in mind not like the first and foremost deduction checklist not like i'm gonna do some art because there are plenty of gymnasts very artistic routines who got way more artistry deductions way more not because they don't have intrinsic musicality and art but because they're not specifically designing a routine to avoid the deductions yep yeah, and I think it's not just like I just one other thing I want to say about yeah. her routine is how her use of dance and change in levels and work on the floor. She doesn't just like, well, now's the time when I lay on the floor and roll around and rest. 
it's when she goes to the floor, she's not just, it's when you extend the farthest to grab the cookie elongation of movement, but also when she contracts, it's the most with all of her body parts and her head and like mm -hmm. squish the organs. That's what I think of the contracting. Like, you know, when someone's slouching, <laughs> but do it the most. Um, yeah. Yeah. Reach for the cookie, squish your organs. That's what you need mm -hmm. to know about the artistry checklist. You're welcome. Good job, Ellie Black. Down on the floor movement is a great opportunity to avoid some checklist deductions. Because you're not thinking about tumbling. Like, you can do so so much extendies. <laughs> let's discuss what's happening in college gymnastics this week. And by let's mm -hmm. discuss, I mean let's talk about what I want to talk about first, which is my uh -huh. favorite leotard of the week. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. the Painted Bird leotard by uh, mm. from UC Davis. This is a... Uh, Sylvia P. Leo, and uh, it, it is a like it literally looks like someone did like is that oil paint? You were an art major. What kind of paint is that? It is like someone painted the bodice and then painted like bird feathers, like an artistic mm -hmm. impression of bird feathers on the top. Um, I love this Leo. It's a truly something different. And there's so much samesies, like, my God, if you don't have side cutouts in your Leo, I mean, this still has kind of a side cutout, but it's at least cut differently. Oh, I can't. We're with the moving side toward cutout. armpit cutouts, which I think is an interesting choice. Yeah, this goes from <laughs> hip. The Leos this, this week. I was like, <laughs> is that really where you want to cut out? <laughs> the, honestly, some of the cutouts this week, I, you guys. <laughs> They're so lit. It's literally now the cutouts are from this where your boob tissue starts to the back of your neck and down like to your butt crack. It is so extreme. I uh, it's it's distractingly extreme. Like I love back muscles. Show off your back muscles. It's great. But this is the, the point where all I can think is that that tiny back strap is going to break because of those back muscles. <laughs> And it's going to be an embarrassing incident like we see in volleyball, beach volleyball, where the outfits do not stay on. And I have, and it's distracting and I worry about it. And that's enough of this crazy ass. It looks like someone took some leftover patches of foil and made them into a front of a Leo. They're like, this is leftover. Like, <laughs> this. <sighs> I thought this started as a Leo that you liked. <laughs> yeah, I love the UC Davis Leo. Sylvia P, the painted <laughs> bird, very artistic. And it's different it's unique uh not that there haven't been other sort of like painted leos but this one really really stands out and i very 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 much enjoy it so has Haley bryant done anything this week or is she like resting on oh, her laurels yeah she almost got a 40 just that <laughs> um started out the competition this week with two tens on vault and bars we were on 40 watch ended up with a 39 925 all around score that ties maggie nichols for the fourth highest all time. So we have Karen Litchie, Georgia, got a 40 in 1996. Mohini Bardwaj got a 39,975 in 2001. She got started with a 9,975 on vault and then got three tens after that. Um, Suzanne Metz at Utah got a 39,995 in 1995. And then Haley Bryant and Maggie Nichols, 39,925. So this ties for the highest score in 23 years in college gymnastics. Yeah. You know, two she's tens. Okay. When she's Maggie right. did it, when Maggie did it, she got one ten and three nine nine seven fives. Yeah, um, I wanted to give an amendment to last week's discussion about the most mm. consecutive um, tens. So tens in a row—that's what consecutive means, by the way. Oh, um, so you. Jeanette Antolin got her seven consecutive tens on vault, and Jamie Dancher also got seven consecutive tens on floor in twenty twenty two. So 2002, but yeah, 2002, she was not competing in 2022. <laughs> Two years ago, you guys, two years ago, yeah. it was Jamie Dancer just showed up and was like, give me some tens on floor. Yeah, I'm sure she could still do it. I would Come love, on. That. I would yeah. love that to pieces. She came back to an alumni meet and was like, bitches, let me show you how it's done. Here we <laughs> go. Let me get, this how... floor. <laughs> get, get out of the way. Let me show you. Um, okay. So I have some questions because we did college and cocktails. Um, LSU was got a big away score but then cal got a huge massive giant score of one eight one ninety eight 
five. Oh, 189. Yeah. My God. What is it? 1989. <laughs> what is it, Cal in 2000? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 198.55. Huge. I think it's their second highest score in history. No, that's program record for Cal. Program record. Oh, Stanford got their yeah. second highest in program history. So it was a big day like, for Cal. So for Stanford. Yeah. But anyway. Did that change the ranking or is it still? So LSU moved ahead. LSU moved up to second and now Cal is in third because what LSU was behind on is road scores. So they were uh-huh. able to compete in Baton Rouge and be like, this is a road meet and we're going to get because it's at a different arena. So we're going to score 198.4. And then Cal was like, hey, counterpoint, we're going to drive to Stanford and do an away meet and party like it's 2004 and get a 198.55 and Stanford's going to get their second highest score, which is the more like that's the more noteworthy development for me, because with this Cal team, it's like, yeah, this is the most talented Cal team there's ever been this year or the last couple of years. Like they should be setting program records. These are the best gymnasts they've ever had on this team, Um, even if scoring weren't, you know as wild and crazy as it is this cal team would still be setting records with stanford it's like this is a delightful stanford team to watch i very much enjoy their sensibility and also their you know commitment to having toe point even when you don't get rewarded for it there's a lot to like but this is not a roster where i'd be like that's the most talented stanford team we've ever seen like i think of the you know when tabitha yim and um, Liz Tracost were there, and when they were overlapping yeah. with like Elisa Shino and Ch- Carly Janaga and all of these gymnasts, like that's the Stanford team. Um, and they were really good in 2004 when they got like crazy, like scoring was even crazier than it is now. So it's really tough to set Stanford records because it's like with Georgia right now, like, yeah, they're not as good as they used to be. But they're not also not going to set records because they were really good in previous they times. So, so for Stanford good. to get the second highest score in their history, that's like, whoa, we got some things going on. <laughs> but yep. I will say, Chloe Winters 10 on beam that Stanford got this week, I am I have no complaints. Oh, I love it so much. Like, obviously, I love her gymnastics. She's her gymnastics is so beautiful it's everything you want it's the dance combined with the artistry all put together seamlessly um she made ncas last year and um i would say this is in the echelon of tens under the Mm -hmm. ncaa code which you know we have many problems with um how would you rank this as a real 10 is this uh corrupt or correct i mean i'm gonna say like I always have a problem with every single 10 that's ever been given out, but this is like, I'm the pick your battles. I'm very happy with this one. This yeah. one, you know, Haley Bryant got a 10 on vault this week. And I always feel like when she sticks, I'm like, yes, fine. That yes. one I'm also fine with. Um, but Chloe Widner, I'm like, yes, she does things that people get tens for doing less than whether it's yep. in the toe point or the extension. Like so many people do front aerials, aerial walkovers on beam with a bent front knee in that front yep. leg and don't get deducted for it. Chloe Widner is extended the whole time. And there are a few gymnasts who do that, but she is one of them. And so you like to see things like that rewarded that she is being more attentive to and doing better than other people who are getting huge scores on beam. Yep. Um, and they wore the fear of the tree Leo with a big tree up the back. <laughs> so it's all you could ask for. It's the Stanford is Stanford thing. Lu- Luisa Blanco also, uh, speaking of Olympic qualifiers, two tens on vault and floor on senior night at home. She was very excited about them. Um, could we talked about this a lot on college and cocktails. I couldn't get a really good yeah. read on her vault. I mean, I couldn't really tell it intended for, tell if her legs were totally extended, but she definitely didn't hop. We her toes were planted um, and did not move. She ele- she relevated a little, but <laughs> she l- rebound heels together. But yeah, who kept the the toes? Yeah, but there was down. no bounce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, also a crazy thing happened. I mean, I don't I don't know how I feel about this. We're gonna have to discuss. Okay. Yeah. So we had another. This, are you gonna talk about Leanne Wong and the beam cap? Because I feel like we have a lot to say. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. We're gonna talk about another issue with beam caps and so this is the thing we have seen beam cap sabotage in the past yes. but this case so basically what happened to describe what happened if you're not watching along with us leanne wong on beam 
punches for her round off dismount feet are almost off the beam ends up onto the beam cap knocking it loose with one foot as she didn't get anything on her dismount and fell she got a redo beam cap redo was able to redo her dismount hit it squirt a 9925 so my thing about this is from the angle we saw this and again like we're not at the judge's angle. We're not at the side angle for this. But the angle that we saw it on the broadcast, it really looks like her foot um, missed the end of the beam. And it just happened to take the beam cap out mm -hmm. with it. But the beam cap is not for landing on. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's not even level with the beam. The beam cap is slightly lower. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to land on it. It is. It will fall if you put pressure on it. It's not supposed to stay there. Um, it's just like basically if you miss a dismount or you slide, like I had a friend do, um, slid, missed, you know, like slid, straddled the beam, but right on the edge of the beam, and because there wasn't a good beam cap, just slit her leg from ankle to crotch. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just there basically to protect you. If you land short and you run back into the beam or you start by tripping and running into the beam, like we've also seen happen, it's mm -hmm. to stop you from having a major injury. It is not for jumping off of in. So I am, I, this is, I don't, this is the <sighs> argument. I feel like we always have like every two years yes. when this happens. And I will say in terms of the rules, the, NCAA rules, they every so often every few weeks, they do a Q&A, a rules clarification Q&A, um, as if anyone's listening to any of the rules, but they do put that out. And like two weeks ago, maybe, they answered this question and had a clarification, like, what happens if the beam cap gets knocked off? It's not technically considered an equipment failure, because the equipment didn't fail, but the gymnast is permitted to redo their dismount, again, if they knocked it off on their dismount. So the judges followed the rules exactly as they are told to do. That's the precedent, what, what happens. So they didn't really have a choice to do anything else because this is the rule. You get to redo your dismount. Um, but I recognize that it kind of gets, is like you get a, a do-over because she missed her dismount. Like right. it's, a, it's an error, not just, an, and as the rules even say, this is not an equipment malfunction. Right. When you kick the beam cap off. So it does feel like that's a gymnast error rather than something outside your control. So you kind of shouldn't get a do-over. I understand that. I I feel like I like the the sentiment behind this that like, you know, we don't want there to be something distracting happening for the gymnast. But like, you know, if you knock the thing off, it's your fault. If it, if it <laughs> happened, that's the thing. Like, if it falls off as a result of your feet, that's where I feel like you shouldn't actually get a redo. And I think I've changed my mind about this over the years. If mm -hmm. you punch and you punch so hard that it pops out of the end and hits you in the face yeah. while you're doing your <laughs> flip, then you wow. should get a redo. I'm and sure so someone can manage physics. that. <laughs> physics should get a redo, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is like a rubber thing that's stuck in the end, and the it isn't a the yeah. beam is aluminum and it has springs in it and it bounces. I'm sure someone could compress it enough um, mm -hmm. or has the power. But I, yeah, I just think it might be time to revisit this rule because I just, you know, this is not. I don't feel like this is as much as I love Leanne Wong, and obviously she's the queen, and you should always let her go yeah. again. But I just don't <laughs> think this is a. Yeah, if you kick the thing off, it's your own fault. No redo. Is but because is this this didn't seem like the beam cap was faulty, right? Even if it is faulty, like if you if you touch it, and I mean if you land on it, if somehow like it falls and it, you land and it messes the angle, off. it's not supposed to come off. But if you push it hard enough from the top because you round off <laughs> right. onto yeah. it, even with one foot, and then it's your fault. That's if what I'm saying. If you punch a hole in the wall, it's not the wall's fault. Right. The wall did what it was supposed to do. Yeah. If you don't touch it on your dismount and it comes off, yes, redo. If you touch it, no redo. And yeah, that's why we that's have fair. instant replay in 
college gymnastics. So I don't see it, like it's yeah. not like the video's right there. People can look at it. Yeah. Meaning the judges. So, yeah, the this is referee. this is what they've always done, whether it was, you know, Josie Anthony yeah. competing at Kentucky at LSU, Kaylin Ohashi, you've always got, you know, benefit of the redo. gymnast to redo. So it's like, you know, how the rules go, but I definitely recognize the argument against. Yeah. Um, are we doing bracketology now? I would I thought you would never ask. I would never not love to do I would love to do nothing more. That's what I meant to say. It is your love to do nothing thing. more than talk oh, about wait, brackets before, and seedings. Before we get to brackets and seedings, okay. um, I do want to mention that we have a new power ranking. So this is our second power ranking of uh, gymnasts in college. It's our fourth. It's our third. Well, this is our third power ranking of college. Um, good to know. That's about um, right. Totally, you know, debate amongst yourselves. The way we do this is you have a. Um, you pretend you're on in the schoolyard at recess and you're picking your NCAA championship team. It's I don't 20... do anything of that, what you're describing. This is exactly how I do it. What are you talking about? Because I pick by like, who are my best all arounders? And then I pick who's mm -hmm. best on each event. How, what's your philosophy? Um, I just sort of say, Spencer, <laughs> what do you feel like? You're so smart. You're so great. <laughs> How do you feel right now? What's the ranking going to be? And I do that. No, I write. Go, I go through the rankings and write down all of the nominees of who I think could be in my top 20. And I end up with like 40 people. And then I start eliminating just based on like, not you though. And then I end up with like 28. And then, you know, it's, <sighs> it's a knockdown drag out fight to see who gets the spots. Okay, um, I'm glad that you have nominees for yours. Speaking of which, you don't have nominees. You don't assemble a group of more than twenty <sighs> to then choose from, and then have some. And then we do you announce it with an envelope with John Cena standing naked. I mean, it, in my head, not like right. in practice. This is the perfect way to announce it. Finally, the Oscars did something correct. But um, I do want to say that there, you know, every year at these big award show, people wear the outfits and then the coaches choose from these outfits what they should make into a leotard. And sometimes it's great, but I have fears. Spencer, I have fears. Did you see someone was wearing a leotard this time? Was it Emily Blunt? No, Paulson. Emily Blunt was wearing a leotard? Who is the gay best friend of Pascal? Pedro Pascal. I don't know. Um, she's her girlfriend's much older than her. Anyway, she was like a bad. She was like a ratchet nurse, not the OG oh, one. Sarah but then yeah, the you show. were saying Sarah, Sarah Paulson. Paulson. Yeah. So she um had a dress on that was like a pink sequins deal, but then it had a silver um not crotch. It did have a silver outline of the crotch and like a band across like where your hips bend and then like a silver crotch outline. Uh, mm -hmm. it, and I was like, no, no, no. Someone's going to make this into a leotard. We're going to have another vagitard situation like we had in the uh, in the 2010s. And I have concerns, Spencer, and I know you can't see colors, but it was a whole thing. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I just want to let you guys know what my biggest fears mm -hmm. are from the Oscars. Your biggest fears, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise I don't pay attention to the Oscars because I find award shows, I cannot watch them. They make me too nervous. I'm embarrassed for everyone. I'm worried they're going to say something. I don't have that problem with sports. They're trained. People aren't trained to win awards. They should be. Actors there was a aren't child. trained to perform? <laughs> but Did you don't want to perform. What are you saying right now? Then you sound terrible and like you're not being, you know. No, yourself. that's what acting is. Ugh. You go up, you win an award, and you give a performance, which is what you do literally every day. No, no, no. Then it's terrible unless they're really good actors. But you know, some aren't good at acting. They're winning awards <laughs> live, but they're not good at acting live. That's the difference between movies and theater people. Anyway, theater people, mm. bracketology. Well, yeah, I mean, Spencer, yeah. please. Okay, um, I'm ready. Now I'm very distracted. I don't know what we were talking about. Okay. <laughs> so the big deal is group of death conundrum and Arkansas's ranking and what we're doing about that. So 
kind of the story of the next two weeks for me is where Arkansas ends up because of the need to rearrange the regionals placement so that there are not host conflicts. So basically what's happening right now, if the season ended right now, we would have the dreaded Florida, Utah regional. Florida's in fourth, Utah's in fifth. They would go to the same regional. Florida is hosting this. This is the one that all of the other teams are like, do not put me in that regional. Absolutely no. Thank you, please. Florida's competing competing at home. Utah has literally never not made nationals ever. And it's it's the one you don't want to be in, the way the rankings are right now. As it is, as it stands, we would have Missouri going there. And we would have Arkansas also going to that regional based purely on ranking. But Arkansas is a host this year of regionals. So they can't go to that regional. They have to host their own. And Arkansas is like, whew, thank God we are hosts this year and we don't have to be in that regional. So either that's a wonderful coincidence or Jordan Weber has even more like special powers than we previously ascribed <laughs> to her. She does. Because or- Arkansas has figured their way out of that regional and they get to host their own and it's a much better situation for them. But because they would have to be removed from this regional, someone else whose ranking did not put them into that regional would have to be shifted in. And that's where things get messy. That's where things get like, if I'm that team, I'm really upset. Um, And the, the other problem with this is that there are so all of the regionals hosts are in the top 12 at this point. So we have a lot of hosting conflicts. You can't, actually follow the rules to fix any of the hosting conflicts because the rules say okay if this happens you have a conflict two hosts in the same regional the lower seated host is moved uh a spot not greater or less than two seated positions and preferably one position when possible in order to maintain the integrity of the bracket you can't fix this bracket right now by moving arkansas only one or two spots all of that would still produce a host conflict. So if things end the way they are, you're going to have to break the rules somehow. And that could be moving Arkansas three spots in either direction or moving Arkansas two spots. And then you move Michigan one and then you shift to Denver and UCLA a little bit. There are a lot of different solutions, but they're all bad. They're all awful. And they're all going to create a lot of controversy because you have a situation where like all of the teams nine through 16 are getting moved from where their season ranking would put them. And then you're like, well, what was the point of any of this? All season long, we're told like, oh, wins and losses don't matter. It's about your score for your ranking. And then if you're just changing all the rankings anyway, because you have to, because there are host conflicts, it gets to be a potential issue. So basically what I'm saying is the committee would very much like either Arkansas to either start scoring like a 198.5 every week and get the ranking way up or like a 192 and get passed by a bunch of people to solve this issue because it's looming as a potentially significant problem yeah but you you know we still have two more weeks of meets things things are going to change but they're still right now in a very messy situation and someone's going to get the short end of the straw like i was coming up with of course my solutions possible solutions of how you would fix this one of them would have denver getting demoted from ninth to 12th and into the florida and utah regional if you're denver you're like absolutely not no that's super unfair but this is the one way weird's gonna happen yeah i mean on the one hand i'm like yeah it's all that sucks and people are gonna be seated wrong and all that and i'm just like if you're not in the top eight consistently and i know anything could happen That's why regionals is terrifying. You think it's bad watching Mm -hmm. the Oscars? Jesus, the regionals. But like, if you can't score that high, you're not going to make it anyway. You don't deserve to make it. And, you know, teams that don't deserve it make it. So uh, when these things happen. But I feel like if you're... (sighs) You should be able to... Denver and rank ninth. Why can't you... Why shouldn't you make it? I totally agree. I absolutely agree with you. But only the top eight make it. And only the top four really count. Final. So that's <laughs> and that thing. is why it's gonna it's so important to get into like the top eight, get a higher ranking to avoid all of this mess, and suddenly the committee has to do something weird and you get put in the Florida Utah regional and you're like, Well, how did this happen? So yeah, it's it's incumbent upon teams, and one of the reasons which we'll get to why it was very significant that UCLA got a low road score again this weekend is they're right in that mix now. 
or with still. They remain right in that pot of messy garbage that could get put in a very bad regional and kind of can't determine their own destiny because we're going to have to rearrange things. Also, um, a low road score is putting it very kindly. Spencer, you are, that's very that nice. Was, I'm said. very diplomatic. Low. That it was, was a Selena ooh. Harris didn't compete. And that's what happens when Selena Harris does not compete. The other thing that I have an eye on when it comes to brackets and regional placements yeah. is the geographic placement into the Cal regional. Because there are a lot of currently unseated, very good teams in the western part of the country, like Oregon State, one spot out of the seedings right now. Stanford just got almost a 198. You've got potentially the Arizonas, but they're close enough they could go to, like, you know, Arkansas or something. You've got Boise State ranked very well. You've got Washington right up there. That has the potential, if you actually adhere to geographical distribution of the unseated teams, to become a really tough regional for regional semifinals where you've got a lot of very good competitive teams like an Oregon state right there who can absolutely upset someone and knock someone off. So that is also another twist of like, Oh, I maybe I also don't want to go to the Cal regional because like Jade Carey is going to get a 10. And then what do we do? Well, just things, like, I don't care about any of this. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you should be able to beat everybody or you don't deserve to go. That's like, but I mean, it's like, yeah. this is. And then I mean, we that's get... the attitude you have to have if you're one of the Yes. Teams, which is like, we're going to get drawn. We ha And I think that's like, to go back to UCLA, because I think it's been very interesting, the lineups and what they scores and not getting the road scores is, it seems like what they're banking on is at some point, you know, Malibu will be back. Selena Harris can compete, Shay on floor, maybe, mm -hmm. and that, like, we're going to rest now and play the long game and then see if we can show up at regionals and ruin someone else's life, even if we have a low ranking, which is a tough game to play, depending on what regional you get put in, but also dangerous for all the other teams, because UCLA, even though they got a 196-3 in counter to fall on beam last week, do have the potential to score very well. Now that we have bracketology, very important things happening. Yeah. Um, I would like to discuss the most important things that happened, which is my doing the most awards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to talk about UCLA who at their home meets, you know how UCLA has that thing at the end of floor routine. Well, each floor routine, they have their whole student section does the choreography, certain pieces of choreography choreography along with the gymnast so it's not just the team doing it the whole crowd in the back is doing it mm -hmm. at ucla home meets and then the very last routine they throw confetti up in the air in with uh like when a gymnast does their final pose all this confetti flies in the air at the end it's very cool mm -hmm. so the way they do this is they have these handouts that are on your seat and the handouts talk about each gymnast routine with the story of their routine, which I'm like, mm, <laughs> should you tell a story <laughs> or just let people make it up? I mean, I always encourage the weirder story, only if it's weird, only if it's like one of the bizarre over the top, like an alien waitress has learned to sing for the first time. And she's like, if it's that, then I absolutely want to hear about it. <laughs> if it's just like, she's a dancer. I'm like, <laughs> What a story. Um, <laughs> She's excited to be at a college meet is her the, the storyline you're telling. And she's going to smile at the crowd. I'm like, that's not a story. I don't want to know. Her storyline is personality. Um, oh, we had a, so much <sighs> opportunity to show her personality on floor this week. I'm like, no, it is not an opportunity to show your personality. It's an opportunity to show someone else's personality as a character. Literally. That's what you're supposed to do. Honestly, is the is the commentary going backwards this year? Yes. It I'm like what's happening? Like it got so good. Like uh, Kathy and Bart like created this the perfect product and I don't know what happened this year. It's like the amount of not saying anything and literally not giving any idea about how that score should rank or whether it was better than anybody else's no mm -hmm. information. I am. It's killing me. Like, how did it go backwards? Spencer? I'm there I mean, are a few, a few <sighs> exceptions. Yes. obviously. Yes. I feel like it's just, there's way too much rooting for tens 
from the commentators or rooting for high scores. That does not help anything. And there's way too much like focus on, I don't know how to describe it, like not the sport. Yes. Like here, okay, here's the exact example. I'm glad we've gotten onto this tangent because I have a lot of thoughts about it. My exact example is every time LSU has a meet on like big ESPN or big ESPN2, their opening shot is of Olivia Dunn. We love Olivia Dunn on this show, but She's that awesome. time, last time, she was not in a lineup. She was not on a single event in that meet, and you led with Olivia Dunn because followers. But like that is so anathema to what the point of this is which is this is a sporting competition and if you're just gonna make it not about the sport like just stop we don't want to watch right like we we have gotten like we got to this point where like we're finally had the tennessee tipping point and people are finally like we have to have an nca code because we, we need to really improve the scoring so this this is like such a great sport and great product for television and now we need to take the next step and make sure the scoring isn't a joke and i'm not blaming the judges for this i'm blaming the whole system of how ncaa judging works that it's like unwritten rules of how to judge and that's that's mm -hmm. a problem um and it, we got to such a great point with how things were shown and we got all the the uh angles on the screen and all the height meter and all this stuff and now there's so much commentary that's literally saying nothing like, why even be there? It's, I expect to learn something as a person who knows a lot about gymnastics and the mm -hmm. athletes and scoring. I expect to learn something new from you when I'm watching this. And um, the only bright spot I had this weekend, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of good commentators are still doing their jobs, yeah. but in general, it's gone downhill. And um, the, the, the general, like, tone of the broadcast even right. more so than like an individual commentator performance even though some people are just like great job she showed her personality again and i'm like all right but in general i think it's a it's an overall tone right um the um the double maldonados uh which one did the commentary alondra she has the triple no. front full no Ops. andrea andrea has graduated andrea alondra's doing at commentary for iowa state Front triple full. Alondra, younger sister, transferred. Yeah. Um, and so we talked all I mean, she was so great. Andrea, her commentary, she had so much to say, and I totally loved it. And by the way, because we talked about like having a double Maldonado night on Friday night, watching mm -hmm. one commentary do commentary that graduated and one compete. And so Linzers has made a double Maldonado beverage. Ooh, sounds already. Delicious. The official yes. gymnastic uh bartender. Tip your bartenders, you guys. That's all she asks. Um, it has, she has posted it in the forum at gymcasta.com. So you can now try this out. And I love her description, which is that the double Maldonado, two shots worth of coffee components, not necessarily a dangerous amount of ca caffeine, but definitely needed at this point in the season. The Very double Maldonado. Yeah. Yes. So there anyway. were some routines that definitely needed some caffeine this weekend <laughs> from people who usually hit and they're like, it is March. <laughs> <laughs> their legs were and like, I cannot no. <laughs> so anyway okay back to who's doing the most yeah um doing the most award so UCLA with their handouts and make your own confetti because that's what it, it okay. tells you how to dance along and then it tells you okay mm -hmm. last routine rip this into pieces and throw it in the air when this happens and I love that you know I love you know how I love chalkography you know how I love yeah. a prop even if it's make-believe <sighs> like Tasha Tasha Smith and the tug of war with her teammate. Oh, Tasha mm -hmm. Smith. Um, she was at the alumni reunion at Oregon State this uh, past weekend. So if you haven't ever watched a Tasha Smith routine, watch any of them at any time. <laughs> you won't be disappointed. You've done nothing. Start doing everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then the other doing the most award. You guys, I have to say, like, uh, Clemson, again, not only doing the most with their leotards, because oh even if you're not watching their gymnastics, their gymnastics is good. The leotards doing the most. We had the purple jungle rave, um, but with cutouts mm -hmm. so that your purple skin color could blend in with the rave jungle and the laser lights if needed. Um, they had a military appreciation meet and they had people repel from the ceiling okay. into the meet. Repelling. It's not subtle. 
Not at all. I feel like that's the tagline. I mean, if Clemson's inaugural season has a tagline, I think it's Clemson. It's not subtle. (laughs) I mean, obviously, first of all, I hope that they got, um, they also had the military ROTC, I don't know, people like hand, I think, flowers to the uh, seniors, which I loved, and all different genders. Um, And they, um, but I really hope they got that DOD money. Because, you know, the Department of Defense mm. pays for these kind of things. So if you're not already doing it, schools, and you're going to have these things. I would also like, of course, to see the not the Pew Pew military also acknowledged. We would like to see the the other the other parts of, uh, you know, the spies, the people who. Do oh, that's the- where we're going here. I was wondering yeah. where we're going here, that Jessica would like a spy themed <laughs> gymnastics meet. Now it makes sense. Now How it fun would people. that be? You could wear, you know, like a cape and a mask. And I mean, that's you can't be a very good spy with outfits. I on. Mean, but yeah. <laughs> they also do a lot of them have superhero nights. So I feel like cape and a mask is already. One okay, not games. superhero night. But, you know. Like, um, you know, all those... <laughs> you know how spies, what spies do? <laughs> they wear capes and masks and no one can see them. <laughs> how would you dress as a spy? You just wear like a cocktail outfit and then hide secrets in your bra. I mean, I don't know what... You work in a regular office and look like you're super boring, but then yeah. hide things in your briefcase. No, does That's anyone carry a briefcase? Meat. Look that... boring. <laughs> it'll, it'll, the, they'll be knocking down the door. To fill the seats for just like let's dress boring. <laughs> I can see how maybe that doesn't translate as well. Uh-huh. The power of the pen yeah. and the power of the pew pews to repelling is a good visual. So anyway, okay. once again, you guys, here here we are doing the most. Last week we did choose your champion for bars and beam. So this week we're going mm. to do vault and floor. All Spencer, right. yeah. So for vault. I think what's very significant is that all of the top four vaulters right now have handspring pike halves. Mm-hmm. No Yurchenko one and a halves in the top four, all handspring pike halves. So, you know, if you're like, what should these dev gymnasts I'm co- teaching vaults to learn if I want them to be a compelling recruit in a f- several, n- a number of years for colleges, maybe like handsprings yes. would be a cool idea. Um, but top four vaulters, Haley Bryant, versus Mackenzie Wilson versus Sage Kellerman versus Suki Fister battle pan spring pie calf. I am asking you, Jessica, choose your champion. I think this is actually surprisingly hard. It is. That's the thing. Cause like Haley Bryant has hands down the highest, most spectacular mm-hmm. flight yeah. in her vault, hands down amplitude champion, but rarely can stick. Well, this season she finally got like stuck she for the did. first time this past week. Yeah. Typically in previous years, I think she sticks more often, but also it's like she's always almost sticking. Yeah. It's like a little scoot. Yeah. But this is the thing, Mackenzie Wilson, Sage Kellerman, and Suki Fister. Suki Fister has some weird like every once in a while she'll just fall strangely or just have like a what like you know which it's you're going like you know you're a freaking cannonball like running as fast Mm -hmm. as you can at an immovable object so Mm -hmm. you know it's sometimes that happens um but sage kellerman and mackenzie wilson are so consistent and they've gotten so Mm -hmm. many tens (sighs) yeah i think my you know my instinct and my boring answer is Haley bryant because like of course that's the answer But I will say, I think Sage Kellerman has a very good argument in terms of technique, especially in pre-flight and block. The things that don't, like, you can have a bad one and no one cares in college gymnastics and it doesn't necessarily get deducted. You can have, like, a straddle or whatever or insane body position. So I feel like that, even if I'm picking Haley Bryant, which I think I still am, I feel like Sage Kellerman's overall technique, like when she does that and she sticks it and she doesn't have a direction deduction, I'm like, yes, 10. Yeah. This is beautiful. So she is, I did not think that while Haley Bryant was competing NCAA, we would have someone where it was even an argument what the best vault or the best handspring pike half is in college gymnastics. And I think with Sage Kellerman, there is at the very least an argument. Haley Bryant's yeah. is still bigger. 
she still it's so big and then she opens and that is the most impressive part of her vault and that's where she's unbeatable and she has I, she does have the consistency argument in terms of when it isn't stuck it's like this is a 995 because all we're taking is that little you know a little slide back or something that's also in Haley bryant's category but i think sage kellerman has made it this season a very good fight yeah and i think this this really comes down to do you does the the actual skill matter or is it coming down to a landing and if just what happens in the air is the most important thing which we know is not the most important thing in college <laughs> gymnastics then Haley bryant can't win um but yeah it's it's never a conversation i thought we'd be having but i love how they changed the values and people are, are not or they don't change the value but people realize that like seeing your landing coming the whole time you're flipping makes it a lot easier to land i'm just saying <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, but I think changing the value, you know, going back, changing the value yeah. of the Urchenko full forced people to look at other vaults more. And yeah. if you're not going to have a Urchenko one and a half, because that doesn't work for you, maybe a handspring pike half. Floor. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about. Number one ranked on floor, Raina Worley, versus number two ranked on floor, Maya Hooten. So this is what we're narrowing it down to, because, you know, I think choose your champion on floor. I think we have the widest range of options in terms of people who could be ranked one and two, even though like we have great beam routines, but also you look at Reagan Smith and Miley O'Keefe and then like Maya Lazan and you're like, yeah, that's those, those are the, also the best ones. I think we have a wider range of arguments of like, that's the best one. But right now the rankings, Raina Worley, Maya Hooten, what are we saying, Jessica? So this one is also, you know, how I can't pick. I know okay. it's hard for you. This is why this is my torture of you. I know. I talked about brackets. I talked about seedings. I talked about geography, and now I'm forcing you to choose the best among good gymnasts. It's all of your nightmares, and I've never been happier. So here's the thing: what's so impressive about Maya Hooten is her ability to land. Um, so precisely and consistently just stick you can take a controlled mm -hmm. lunch and that's yeah. what Raina Worley does so well too that she can land mm -hmm. and then does the perfect example of a controlled lunge where it literally is her choosing to lift a foot and place it behind her artistically right um but I have to say I mean oh this is oh Okay, I'm going to go with... This is very challenging. I'm going to go... Neither of them are particularly, like, crazy great artistically or great dancers. So, based on that, I think their routines are very similar. Um, uh -huh. So, I'm going to go with Raina Worley based on full and kick out. Okay. I would say, if you're basing it... My thing is, if you're basing it on tumbling, I think there's no beating Maya Hooten in terms of control well, then her middle in terms pass. Of chest position oh yeah and like if this were exclusively about tumbling and your ability to hit a 180 in a straddle position maya hooten is the top gymnast on floor in college gymnastics my reason for picking reina worley which is what i'm going with here is maya hooten's dance element series is a switch side and then she does a quarter turn on the way down into a straddle jump three quarter rather than doing a switch side to popa that shouldn't get popa credit mm. and it should at the very least have a deduction for you know overturning and then not doing an actual popa i don't think that should get popa credit i think that should be downgraded the value part should be downgraded because it's a straddle three quarter it's not a full turn and so that's the only thing for me in my Hooten's routine because I don't think I have the same issue performance wise that Jessica does with my Hooten where I'm like, no, she's not going all out, but like most people aren't <laughs> that we don't yeah. give deductions. Right. For. You can just tell she could. That's the she thing. <laughs> like she could skyle the, between... the shit out of that routine if she wanted to, but also like, you know, if you're going to tumble that perfectly, maybe you can't dance full out. <laughs> it's all of it. They both have, full twisting double backs that are very among the best and have a little bit of leg stagger at the end, a little bit of shins apart, flexed feet, slight stagger. And I think they both do it. Um, so that's kind of a wash for me. Well, this is no good because I 
picked Raina Worley because I thought you were going to pick Maya Hooten, and that's how I split up my favorites because <laughs> otherwise I would have just said it's a tie. Yeah. God damn it. Well, we can pick the same person. That's not not allowed. I know, but it's more fun when we debate aggressively. I know. But I think we made other. some solid cases because I we think did. there's a very compelling case for Maya Hooten as well, like the best tumbler. If you don't want to bother with the whole joining club gym nerd thing, you can just give us money. Check out the No Strings Attached Donate button at the bottom of the Join the Club page at gymcastic.com slash club. We have a mini commission. Will you okay. introduce this and tell people how our mini commissions work? Uh, our club gym nerd members can purchase mini commissions by joining at a certain level, like Rayanne has done. Who mini commission? Who ordered a mini commission that I will not be touching with a ten foot pole? Called "How Do Gymnasts Maintain Their Bikini Lines?" <laughs> That's I have perfect. nothing to contribute to this conversation, Jessica. You may begin. So, Spencer, I mean, well, I feel like you do because you did one of the most amazing during the Tokyo Olympics um, advertisements we've ever had, where we did a host red <laughs> ad where you did it for the. Hair suit gentleman shaver. What is that called? Yeah. The uh, manscaper. Do we uh, mention it now that we're not getting any money from them? <laughs> I don't care to bastards. mention it. Get us back. It was so good. Um, the, he- the one with the headlight. Anyway, so um, here is the thing. How I would like to, you know, how do you maintain your bikini line? Well, it's just, it's the same rules apply. It depends on how much hair you have. So if you've got like, you know, a full bush that goes onto your legs, then you're going to need a little more maintenance than someone that's like, you know, doesn't have as much. So someone I, you know, heard from gymnasts who have that kind of hair that basically they had to get like laser hair removal because there's just too much to maintain on a regular basis. Because the problem is, and I did, we have actually talked about this. We had a previous question years ago about this. And I asked a whole bunch of college gymnasts and elites how they maintained and, and the elites tended to do more of something that is takes more hair away and lasts longer, but that's because they had so much time in between competing. Because in practice, you don't have to just wear your Leo. You can wear shorts um, normally. There's some college uh, gyms where they don't allow this. You have to be leotard all the time. Um, and so the reason that people wait sometimes um, and just do something like, uh, sugaring or waxing is because that lasts longer, um, but you have to have enough hair for them to rip out of your skin for it to work. The reason that a lot of gymnasts, especially college gymnasts, um, just shave is because um, they have to be leotard ready every single week for four months. And because of that, they don't have time to let enough hair grow back to then be able to um wax or sugar or whatever. And then, you know, the people that are just have like too much to manage, um, or they don't want to ever worry about this, get permanent laser. And now there's like the laser you can do at home. The thing that I just, I'm, this is what my teammate used to do from Bulgaria. I talk about her all the time. Mm-hmm. She used to do that, her, that torture device where you, it's like a thing that has these uh, coils in it, like electrical coils that spin around. And she was like, it's so great. Jesse, just use this at home. Like she touches it to my leg. It is like if you're, if your hair on your body got stuck in something and someone slowly yanked it out of your skin over and over and over, it's the most painful kind of hair removal. Waxing is less painful than that epilady thing horrific torture device like i'm sure this is you know they designed some kind of testing you know mattresses with this apparatus and then they were like oh look i accidentally pulled my hair on my arm out let's sell it to women and paint it pink and charge a lot for it (laughs) anyway so to answer you rayanne thank you for your question um it depends on how much you compete a lot of uh, a lot of shaving because you have to have it you know tidy all the time but as I've always said, I do believe that there should be a um, stipend specifically for hair maintenance and boob tape maintenance 
based on the cut of the leotards because leotards are literally cut smaller at the crotch than they used to be. It's an actual design. It's called the college cut. And it is that for, instead of a V shape, it somehow goes in and then out again. Um, and that is a new thing in the last like 10 years. Um, so good times. Maintaining your bikini line, more relevant and important than ever. So thank you so much for your question. If you'd like to commission a question like this, you can ask us anything and we'll talk about it for a couple minutes. As long as it's tangentially gymnastics related, um, you can sign up at Club Gym Nerd at gymcastic.com and submit your question. So thank you so much, Rand, and thank you for supporting the show. Uh, we have a bit of fan mail this week in the mm. feedback. Jimcastic at gmail.com, or you can put your feedback in the form, um, and we will try to get to whatever we can. We have a lot of questions, but this one's very important, obviously. Very important, because Anne says, just a quick note to say y'all are the best. You've built a wonderful and amazing community, and so many of us are so grateful for you. I love playing fantasy this season. Even though five up five count is brutal, I pray NCAA never goes in this direction. Anyway, keep being you. Thank you. Do in you pray NCAA does go in that direction, Jessica? Yes. I want it to be even harder. So I want it to be five up, five count. No, you can throw away one routine. No. I want it to be so hard. And this way more teams will get to the top. Because right now, you can have a fall on every event and still win. A lot mm -hmm. of teams do win with at least one fall, but you can literally have a fall on every event and still win. So next letter, inflation data. Tish says, I very much enjoyed your discussion on score inflation inflation from one of your listeners this week. Data like this is my bag also. I've done similar analysis myself a couple of years ago for the 2019 Worlds. I looked at e-scores by subdivision by apparatus and found no significant differences between subdivisions. The plots looked like there might be slight inflation on vault between subdivisions 1 and 3, but that difference is not significant when you run the statistics. I've attached the plots I made at the time. Looking forward to hearing more of this sort of stuff on the podcast. Have a great day. And if you are watching along, you may see that we are showing you right now. The plots. That's what they are. There's a plotting. That's what we had in our 20 in the last discussion that we had about whether or not the seeding for what group you, you're in and competing in first at the Olympics matters or not. And looking back, Dr. Brooke looked back at those. Speaking of Dr. Brooke. We have a study that she is doing, and um, we're, she needs your help for the study, and we're going to open this up to Club Gym Nerd members first on Collagen Cocktails this, um, this Friday at after we watch Denver, Michigan at 7 p.m. Pacific. So uh, one more letter that we have, and I just want to give a shout out. Um, Diana sent this in and the Brexville Broadview Heights high school gymnastics team just won their 21st consecutive consecutive Ohio State championship in gymnastics 21 consecutive and this is the thing she points out this isn't just, you know, when some people think, well, it's high school gymnastics, like it's not going to be that high of a mm -hmm. level. Have you met gymnastics in the United States? Lousy <laughs> with level nines and tens. Every, you can't throw a rock without hitting a level 10 in the United States. They're everywhere. They are doing difficult gymnastics. They had um, a competitor get um, Farina. She got a 10 on her Yurchenko layout. They had another gymnast. This is back of the day throwing Yurchenko fulls. These are gymnasts competing here who are going on to compete at Division mm -hmm. One colleges who are competing in this. Do not look down on high school gymnastics because it is so amazing and so fun. And for a lot of people, it can be their first opportunity to do gymnastics. Public school, free to all. This is legit and amazing. Um, so Shout out to them and shout out to their coaches. And congratulations to you guys. Keeping the streak alive by half a tenth. They did it. Consecutive. That's crazy, Spencer. I mean, seven it tens is. in a row is amazing. 21 years. We will see you guys Friday night at mm -hmm. seven after the Denver, Michigan meet. We're going to have a lot to discuss. Um, remember to... Set your downloads so this show automatically downloads on your favorite podcast player so you don't get stuck when you're traveling or in an airplane. 
and you can't stream. This is the worst thing that could possibly happen in life, obviously. Remember to get your virtual season pass. The virtual season pass, four shows for the pi price of three, you guys. It's a great deal. Club Dimner members on sale now for you. So thank you so much for listening. We'll see you at College and Cocktails on Friday night at 7 p.m. And thanks for listening. Remember to take up on gay, split on rights.